Section four of Horace Walpole's Letters a Selection. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Battle of Culloden to Sir Horace Mann, Arlington Street, April the twenty fifth, seventeen forty six. You have bidden me for some time send you good news. Well, I think I will. How good would you have it? Must it be a total victory over the rebels with not only the boy that is here killed but the other that is not here too their whole army put to the sword besides an infinite number of prisoners all the jacobite estates in england confiscated and all those in scotland what would you have done with them or could you be content with something much under this how much will you abate Will you compound for Lord John Drummond taken by accident, or for three Presbyterian parsons who have very poor livings, stoutly refusing to pay a large contribution to the rebels? Come, I will deal as well with you as I can, and for once, but not to make a practice of it, will let you have a victory. My friend Lord Berry arrived this morning from the Duke, though the news was got here before him. For with all our victory, it was not thought safe to send him through the heart of Scotland, so he was shipped at Inverness within an hour after the Duke entered the town, kept beating at sea five days, and then put on shore at North Berwick, from whence he came post in less than three days to London but with a fever upon him for which he had been twice blooded but the day before the battle but he is young and high in spirits and i flatter myself will not suffer from this kindness of the duke the king has immediately ordered him a thousand pound and i hear will make him his own aide-de-camp my dear mr shute i beg your pardon i had forgot you have the gout and consequently not the same patience to wait for the battle with which I, knowing the particulars, postpone it. On the 16th, the Duke, by forced marches, came up with the rebels a little on this side in Venice. By the way, the battle is not christened yet. I only know that neither Preston, Pants, nor Falkirk are to be godfathers. The rebels, who fled from him after their victory, and durst not attack him when so much exposed to them at his passage of the Spey, now stood him they seven thousand he ten. They broke through Barrel's regiment, and killed Lord Robert Carr, a handsome young gentleman, who was cut to pieces with above thirty wounds. But they were soon repulsed and fled, the whole engagement not lasting above a quarter of an hour. The young pretender escaped. Mr. Conway says he hears wounded. He certainly was in the rear. They have lost above a thousand men in the engagement and pursuit, and six hundred were already taken, among which latter are their French ambassador and Earl Kilmarnock. The Duke of Perth and Lord Ogilvy are said to be slain. Lord Elko was in a salivation and not there. Except Lord Robert Carr, we lost nobody of note. Sir Robert Rich's eldest son has lost his hand, and about a hundred and thirty private men fell. The defeat is reckoned total, and the dispersion general, and all their artillery is taken. It is a brave young duke. The town is all blazing round me as I write with fireworks and illuminations. I have some inclination to lap up half a dozen skyrockets to make you drink the Duke's health. Mr. Doddington, on the first report, came out with a very pretty illumination, so pretty that I believe he had it by him, ready for any occasion. Trial of the Jacobite Lords Balmerino and Kilmarnock to Sir Horace Mann, Arlington Street, August the 1st, 1746. I am this moment come from the conclusion of the greatest and most melancholy scene 
I ever yet saw. You will easily guess it was the trials of the rebel lords. As it was the most interesting sight, it was the most solemn and fine. A coronation is a puppet show, and all the splendour of it idle, but this sight at once feasted one's eyes and engaged all one's passions. It began last Monday. Three parts of Westminster Hall were enclosed with galleries and hung with scarlet, and the whole ceremony was conducted with the most awful solemnity and decency, except in the one point of leaving the prisoners at the bar amidst the idle curiosity of the crowd, and even with the witnesses who had sworn against them, while the lords adjourned to their own house to consult. No part of the royal family was there which was a proper regard to the unhappy men who were become their victims. One hundred and thirty-nine lords were present, and made a noble sight on their benches, frequent and full. The Chancellor, in square brackets Hardwick, was Lord High Steward, but though a most comely personage with a fine voice, his behaviour was mean curiously searching for occasion to bow to the minister in square brackets mr pelham that is no peer and constantly applying to the other ministers in a manner for their orders and not even ready at the ceremonial to the prisoners he was peevish and instead of keeping up to the humane dignity of the law of england whose character it is to point out favour to the criminal he crossed them and almost scolded at any offer they made towards defence. I had armed myself with all the resolution I could, with the thought of their crimes and of the danger past, and was assisted by the sight of the Marquis of Lothian in weepers for his son who fell at Culloden, but the first appearance of the prisoners shocked me. Their behaviour melted me. Lord Kilmarnock and Lord Cromarty are both past forty, but look younger. Lord Kilmarnock is tall and slender with an extreme fine person. His behaviour, a most just mixture between dignity and submission. And if anything to be reprehended, a little affected and his hair too exactly dressed for a man in his situation. But when I say this, it is not to find fault with him, but to show how little fault there was to be found. Lord Cromarty is an indifferent figure, appeared much dejected and rather sullen. He dropped a few tears the first day and swooned as soon as he got back to his cell. For Lord Balmerino, he is the most natural, brave old fellow I ever saw the highest intrepidity even to indifference. At the bar he behaved like a soldier and a man, in the intervals of form, with carelessness and humour. He pressed extremely to have his wife, his pretty Peggy, with him in the tower. Lady Cromarty only sees her husband through the grate, not choosing to be shut up with him, as she thinks she can serve him better by her intercession without. She is big with child, and very handsome. So are their daughters. When they were to be brought from the tower in separate coaches, there was some dispute in which the axe must go. Old Balmerino cried, Come, come, put it with me. At the bar he plays with his fingers upon the axe while he talks to the gentleman jailer. And one day, somebody coming up to listen, he took the blade and held it like a fan between their faces. During the trial a little boy was near him, but not tall enough to see. He made room for the child and placed him near himself. When the trial began, the two worlds pleaded guilty, Balmerino not guilty, saying he could prove his not being at the taking of the castle of Carlisle as was laid in the indictment. Then the King's counsel opened, and Sergeant Skinner pronounced the most absurd speech imaginable, 
and mentioned the duke of perth who said he i see by the papers is dead then some witnesses were examined whom afterwards the old hero shook cordially by the hand the lords withdrew to their house and returning demanded of the judges whether one point not being proved though all the rest were the indictment was false to which they unanimously answered in the negative then the lord high steward asked the peers severally whether lord balmerino was guilty all said guilty upon honour and then adjourned the prisoner having begged pardon for giving them so much trouble while the lords were withdrawn the solicitor general murray brother of the pretender's minister officiously and insolently went up to lord balmerino and asked him how he could give the lords so much trouble when his solicitor had informed him that his plea could be of no use to him balmerino asked the bystanders who this person was and being told he said oh mr murray i am extremely glad to see you i have been with several of your relations the good lady your mother was of great use to us at perth are you not charmed with this speech how just it was as he went away he said they call me jacobite i am no more a jacobite than any that tried me but if the great mogul had set up his stand that i should have followed it for i could not starve the worst of his case is that after the battle of dumblaine having a company in the duke of argyle's regiment he deserted with it to the rebels and has since been pardoned lord kilmarnock is a presbyterian with four earldoms in him but so poor since lord wilmington stopping a pension that my father had given him that he often wanted a dinner lord cromarty was receiver of the rents of the king's second son in scotland which it was understood he should not account for and by that means had six hundred a year from the government lord ellibank a very prating impertinent jacobite was bound for him in nine thousand pounds for which the duke is determined to sue him when the peers were going to vote lord foley withdrew as too well a wisher lord moray as nephew of lord balmerino and lord stair as i believe uncle to his great-grandfather lord windsor very affectedly said i am sorry i must say guilty upon my honour lord stamford would not answer to the name of henry having been christened harry what a great way of thinking on such an occasion i was diverted too with old norser the father of my brother's concubine an old jew that kept a tavern my brother in square brackets orford as auditor of the exchequer has a gallery along one whole side of the court i said i really feel for the prisoners old issachar replied feel for them pray if they had succeeded what would have become of all us when my lady townsend heard her husband vote she said i always knew my lord was guilty but i never thought he would own it upon his honour lord balmerino said that one of his reasons for pleading not guilty was that so many ladies might not be disappointed at their show on wednesday they were again brought to westminster hall to receive sentence and being asked what they had to say lord kilmarnock with a very fine voice read a very fine speech confessing the extent of his crime but offering his principles as some alleviation having his eldest son his second unluckily was with him in the duke's army fighting for the liberties of his country at culloden 
where his unhappy father was in arms to destroy them. He insisted much on his tenderness to the English prisoners, which some deny and say he was the man who proposed their being put to death when General Stapleton urged that he was come to fight and not to butcher, and that if they acted any such barbarity he would leave them with all his men. He very artfully mentioned Van Hoey's letter, and said how much he should scorn to owe his life to such intercession. Lord Cromarty spoke much shorter and so low that he was not heard but by those who sat very near him, but they prefer his speech to the other. He mentioned his misfortune in having drawn in his eldest son, who was prisoner with him, and concluded with saying, If no part of this bitter cup must pass from me, not mine, O God, but thy will be done. If he had pleaded not guilty, there was ready to be produced against him a paper signed with his own hand for putting the English prisoners to death. Lord Leicester went up to the Duke of Newcastle and said, I never heard so great an orator as Lord Kilmarnock. If I was your grace, I would pardon him and make him paymaster. Great intercession is made for the two earls. Duke Hamilton, who has never been at court, designs to kiss the king's hand and ask Lord Kilmarnock's life. The king is much inclined to some mercy, but the duke, who has not so much of Caesar after a victory as in gaining it, is for the utmost severity. It was lately proposed in the city to present him with the freedom of some company. One of the aldermen said aloud, Then let it be of the butchers. The Scotch and His Royal Highness are not at all guarded in their expressions of each other. When he went to Edinburgh in his pursuit of the rebels, they would not admit his guards, alleging that it was contrary to their privileges. But they rode in sword in hand, and the Duke, very justly incensed, refused to see any of the magistrates. He came with the utmost expedition to town in order for Flanders, but found that the court of Vienna had already sent Prince Charles thither without the least notification, at which both the king and duke are greatly offended. When the latter waited on his brother, the prince carried him into a room that hangs over the wall of St. James's Park, and stood there with his arm about his neck to charm the gazing mob. Murray, the pretender's secretary, has made ample confessions. The Earl of Trackware and Mr. Barry, a physician, are apprehended, and more warrants are out. So much for rebels. End of section 4